This is my 18th year for a big tent in the city of Belfast, and it's time everybody was tired listening to me. But somehow or other, when a man tells his experience that the living God has given to him, the people in the north of Ireland, more than any other country, love to come and hear that story. It's my privilege and responsibility to tell you that tonight, and I sincerely hope that it will be to the profit of all, both saved and unsaved. I was born in the county Monaghan, in the townland of Braddocks, halfway between the two little towns of Monaghan and Bally Bay. There was a big family and a very small farm, and we were poor. There was two men preaching in an orange hall five miles away, and my brothers and sisters walked there every night and walked back again. One day it was a very wet day, and they come in from working in the fields, and they gathered around a big turf fire. And they were talking about the preachers and how they could preach, and what they said, and the crowd that was there, and how good the meetings, and I was running about on a clay floor in my bare feet. So I began to take stock, and I said, Is it a queer kind of Christianity, this? If I know anything, they're enjoying the good fire, and a good conversation, and I'm out on a clay floor on my bare feet, and a lot tolerated. So I got up on the kitchen table in my bare feet, and I said, if you're not born again, you'll be in hell, every one of you. That was my first sermon when I was six years of age. At no time to pass any preliminary marks nor to pronounce the benediction, I, had a good, I got a good slap in the ear, which I richly deserved, and was put to bed without any porridge. Well, the slap in the ear was bad enough, but yet no porridge was far worse. As the family grew up, they went elsewhere, in different places, Belfast, Monmouthtown, uh, England, some to America, for to earn a living for themselves. They were quite right for that. The result was that there was only two little boys, and I was one of them, left at home on the farm. And there was nobody to work the farm, and we couldn't afford to pay anybody, although it was only a shilling a day, with the result that we soon came to poverty. We had to sell out our little farm, and we did that. And so far as I knew, paid our debt and went across to England. We went to live with my mother's sister and auntie. It was an ungodly family. We got on fairly well for 12 months as far as I can remember, and then we got thrown out. I remember well the day it happened. I don't know where my mother went, and I don't know where my brother went. But I know that at 12 o'clock at night, I was in a back entry... When the town hall clock of Birkenhead struck twelve, I was all alone, I was cold, I was hungry, I was lonely. I said, well, I'll wait on the night policeman going by and I'll make a noise with my feet and he'll take me to the barracks and that'll be better than being here. So by and by I heard a heavy footfall and I made a noise with my feet and the man shouted, who's there? I said, me, sir, did he come down? So I went down to see him. And I'm thankful to God it wasn't a policeman. It was a great big tramway man going off late duty. He said, what are you doing here, boy? I didn't say anything. Have you no home? No, I've no home. Have you no friends? No, I don't know where they are. What are you going to do? He said, I, I don't know. And while I live, I'll never forget that big man taking my dirty little hand in his. And he said, come with me. He took me round the corner into a house where he lived. And he said, be as quiet as ever you can, don't make any noise. For if my wife knows that anybody in the house, she'll put you out. He went to the oven at the, at the fire and took out his supper and put a knife right through it and gave me half. Well, brethren, you may say that you can't thank God when you're a sinner. I'm sure I did. I thank God for getting in and for the supper and I ate it. And now, said he, you'll have to be out of here at six o'clock in the morning, because my wife will get up then, and there'll be an awful row if she knows you were in. Now, I got out at six o'clock in the morning, and I don't remember whether I got any breakfast or not, but I was thankful to God in the morning for a good supper the night before. Now, I can't tell you what happened the next day. 
It mustn't have been of very much importance, but I don't remember it, so I'll skip over that and cut a lot out for the sake of time. When I had to go to school in England for four years, in Ireland, then you could go if you liked, and I didn't like, so I didn't go. But then, at I, in England, I had to go, and I want to tell you, they were very severe on me. But no matter, we can't help that now. Then, when I went there for four years, I learned things I never saw in the quiet little home in County Monaghan. I learned bad language, that's a dirty thing. I learned to tell lies, and no liars in heaven, Revelation 21 8. By and by, I learned to play football, I got passionately fond of football. Then I left school and I went to work for an old woman for two and sixpence a week and I was thankful to God to get it. Well then she gave me the sack because she was a Catholic and I was a Protestant. I hardly knew the difference but I knew I got the sack anyway. Well then it wasn't long till I got another little job in a green goose shop where I had to work very hard for a half a crown a week. Now all the time I was learning to play football. There was four things got hold of me when I was a boy, and the one was going to theatres. The other was uh, boxing. The other was going. Well, the other was gambling, and the fourth was football. I got passionately fond of football. It's good, clean recreation for a sinner, but it's certainly no place for a Christian, neither as a player nor a spectator. It grieves the spirit of God to see you there. And I went from there to Fort Sunlight Lever Brothers, where I started for five shillings a week. And I went there because I wanted off on Saturday evening to play football. So I did. I played for five years over there. And I must say, it's a big say in this, I was as fond of the football, a bag of wind, as I am of my Bible now. I'm not saying something. It's only those who play with it who know what a passion you get for them. I enjoyed it certainly. But there was a strange thing happened occasionally when I was playing. I played what was called outside left. Some of you know what that means. Many a Saturday I wished it had been left outside when I had to meet, when I had to meet a great big right half back and right full back and then the goalkeeper on the goal. Now then, uh, sometimes there was an awful sadness come over me and the boys would say, I wonder what's wrong with Knox. Is he sick? No. I never found out what was wrong with me until I got saved up in Donegal and my sister said, yes, I was praying for you. And it just took the whole steam out of me. I couldn't understand what it was, neither could anybody else. So I thank God for that sister's prayer. Now by and by the foreman thought he was as good a man as me and I thought he wasn't and that ended the contract at Port Sunlight. <laughs> then I was out of work for a good while and I, the Lord knows what any old boots I had, I walked them off my feet trying to get a job. For I never was a sponger and I never was a rogue. And I always believed in paying my debt. And I used to walk till I was sore and tired. And then I would lie down on the shore on the banks of the Mersey at Rock Ferry and sleep till my heart was content and waking up starving with hunger. I had that for several weeks. Then I went to the Lord Mayor of Birkenhead, his name was Mr. Miller, and he was reared in the next town land to us in County Monaghan. He went to school with my elder brothers and sisters. He got on well in business and he became the Lord Mayor. And I went to see him one day and I told him who I was and what I was. He was a nice man and he looked at me for a while. Says he, Frank, you're like a boy wasn't doing well. And I hung my head in shame. Said he, do you not think it's time you were thinking about eternity? That's the only man ever spoke to me about eternity all the time I was in England, about 12 years. I said nothing. Said he, I want you to come up to my house in St. John's Park. And you could visualize me going to a big house in St. John's Park, but I went anyway. And he showed me into a big room. He was a very nice man. And you know there's that many big rugs on the floor that I wasn't too sure whether they were dead or alive. <laughs> but at any rate, he came in and he gave me something to eat. And now said he, I'm going to pray with you. Thank God for that. And then when he was bidding me goodbye, he put something into my hand. I thought it was a sixpence and I'd have been thankful to God for it. And then I thought it was a shilling. 
But as soon as I got out, I made right for the lamp in the street in Rock Ferry, and I opened it, and I nearly fainted because it was a half sovereign. And I ran all the way to my lodgings, most of a mile. And I went right into the landlady, her husband was out of work, and I put it on the table. She, she knocks, did you steal it? Said, I know. I, there was too much of the Presbyterian about me to steal things, and I wasn't alone. So she began to weep. She was thankful to God to get it. Said she, do you want anything out of it? Said I, give me sixpence if you please. And she did. Now that, that Lord Mayor, a perfect gentleman, he's dead now. And he did all in his power to get me a job. Now that was a wonderful thing. And he gave me letters to quite a lot of places. I won't go over them now. They were all nice to me, but they all said, no, we have no opening for a boy like you. I was very sad. Then I got word from Liverpool that there was a job for me in a generating station there from a neighbour that lived beside me. Said he'd come with me in the morning and you'll get started. And again I tried to thank God as best I knew how. So away we went across the Mersey to Liverpool. We got to the generating station and I was getting my old coat off to start the job. A message comes from the manager saying, I have a man for that job already. Well, I'll tell you the truth, I was very angry. I was angry with God. I don't know why those things happened to me, and I couldn't understand. But after I got saved, I could understand quite simply. Now then, I looked for work as long as I could, but it was absolutely in vain. I had a brother living in Belfast, some of you know him, called James. He lived up in Agincourt Avenue. He was saved when I was two years of age. Nearly all our family of ten were saved up in County Monaghan, not all of them. That's a marvellous thing where there was no gospel, and there's very little yet. <coughs> now then, he kept writing to me, this man, he didn't send me any money, for he hadn't any. He was only a working man for twenty-five shillings a week, keeping his wife and two of the family. But he kept writing me letters and inviting me over. And I used to read these letters and think them over well. I'm certainly not doing well here. I would do better there. But they're Christian. Now I didn't know the difference between Christianity and religion. Well I want to tell you all tonight that as far apart as the poles from north to south. But I didn't know any difference. At last the Lord tightened up on me. And I was starving with both cold and hunger. And I wouldn't go to my lodgings for the woman had nothing to give me. And I took a letter out of my pocket and I looked at it and I said... There's a letter from a brother that loves me and that's interested in me and he's a Christian and he wants me to go to Belfast and I'll go tonight. And I hadn't a penny in my pocket. But mind you, when I make up my mind to do a thing, you'd get a better get out the road. For I likely get there. So I went down the road to a little shop and uh, I went into the man and he, I said, uh, Mr. Matthews, I'm going to Belfast for to get a job. Well, to see, Frank, I'm glad to hear that. I said, but I've no money. Well, said he, what do you want? I said, five bob. I used to say a bob instead of shilling. Well, says he, I'll lend you ten francs. And when you get rich, you'll pay me. Said, I, I'll pay you before I get rich. Now then, although that was at seven o'clock at night, I was on the boat at nine o'clock. I didn't take long to pack my luggage simply because I hadn't any. <laughs> I must have had a very pleasant voyage for I lay down on the deck at Liverpool and wakened up in Belfast. It was a beautiful sail and a beautiful night's sleep on the deck. Now when I landed here, I started to talk to myself. I wonder what kind of people these are. What in all the world kind of a body is a Christian? I wonder will they preach to me? I wonder will they convert me? I wonder will they save me for they had been talking about safe. And I kept wending my way up to Agincourt Avenue. Well, I said to myself, I can't be any worse than what I am. And if I try to make me religious, I'll throw the whole thing at them and away I'll go again. So I went to the door and knocked and I wondered what was going to happen. And his wife came and she said, Frank, I'm glad to see you. Well, I didn't know whether she was or not, but she proved that she did love me. And she took me in and she gave me some food. And I was very, very lonely that day. No companions, no sin, and no money, and no nothing. I was very lonely, but it was just the medicine I needed. She gave me something to eat at dinner time and tea time, and I was thankful to God for it. Now, it's necessary to tell you these things, for to show you how God led me by a right way. My brother came home in the evening and said, Frank, I'm glad to see you. 
while they were inclined to believe him a little bit more than his wife, but they both proved that they really were glad to see me and they loved me. Now when bedtime come, he said, Frank, I'm going to show you your room. I a room of your place. And she, she took me into a little room away up in the attic where there was a nice little clean bed that I don't think I had ever been in before. Now he put me in and then said he, now whenever you're in bed, Frank, knock the wall and I'll come in and help you. I didn't say anything. It was nearly the first bit of real kindness I ever have got in my life. I'm not reflecting on anybody, mind you, but I'm saying I come up the rough way. It's good medicine if you can stand it, but it's hard to stand it. Now just to please him, I knocked at the wall and he come in and he took the clothes in round me. I never remembered anybody doing that before. And then did he put them around my neck, said he, Frank, are you all right? But Frank couldn't answer. There was something stuck in my throat. And I said to myself, if these are Christians, the soon I'm one the better. I've got a little job for ten shillings and I gave it to my sister-in-law. And she needed it. For mind you, she hadn't much profit of it whenever she fed me. And she fed me well. Now then, I heard them talking about a big tent. That is a queer thing that these people, Christians, talking about a big tent. You'd wonder that them talking about, but I thought it was a circus. And I begin to cheer up. And I said at a trial to you, there's a circus coming, and I'll have a dust up somebody. And you know, they kept on talking about the big tent, the big tent, and I was longing to see it, and so I did see it. For my brother, I think, there was a wee bit of Jacob about him, and says, see, Frank, you're very lonely, and you and me'll go for a walk through the park. I said, all right. I would have done anything for him. I was very fond of him, and he was so kind to me. So when we walked through the park, says he, we'll just stop in here, the big tent. It was well done, mind you. So I to myself, as sure as you're there, we're in for it. I'm going to have a big night. But why is he coming? But lo and behold you, when I got in through the tent, it was a great big canvas tent in Templemore Avenue where the big high school is now. And there was two old men up on the platform as I what under the sun of a stuck now. And you know, they talked away. I didn't know a thing they said. No, I didn't hear a word they read. I was so busy looking around the tent and the ropes and the things. I didn't hear anything on Thursday night. That's to be candid. Now, Sunday came and my brother said to me, Now, Frank, I want you to go to the gospel meeting tonight in the big tent. Said he, are you going? I said, I said, are you going? He said, no, I am not. And said, I, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the gospel hall. Said, I, could I not go with you? He said, you couldn't. But today I want you to go to the tent. You'll have a bigger meeting and you'll have a better meeting. Well, I wasn't too sure about that. But then he pleased me well when he said, I want you to bring home something you heard, and man, I did. And I'll never forget it until the day I die, whether that's long or short. Now, I never heard a word that David Ray said. Never reached me at all. But the other preach was Alexander Jordan, that is the father of our brother Sam Jordan, who is an evangelist with us, as most you know. Now, he, started, he read John 3:18. He didn't read verse 36. He read verse 18. I didn't care about neither him nor the verse. I kept looking round the crowd of people and I wonder what they all wanted. And I kept looking round the tent. But I looked at the preacher anyway and I saw that the man was sweating, I should say, perspiring at the bowl. But the sweat was running down his face. Well, I said to myself, whatever this old gentleman's talking about, he's in earnest anyway. And the preacher that's not in earnest should give the job up. So I went on looking around me and for a little while and I looked back again. For each man only preached about 20 minutes each. And the next time I looked at him, the tears was running down his face. Now that reached me. So this old man, he's not only in earnest, but he loves the people he's preaching to. I wonder would he love me. And he looked right at me. At least I thought he did. And I thought he pointed at me. And he said, young man, according to this verse, you are condemned already. And if you die on the seat, you'll be in hell. I never will forget that until the day I die. I'm not trying to imp imp impersonate the man or act as he. He was a good man. He was a good preacher for all good men are not good preachers. And all good preachers are not good men. But he was both. That's all I heard that night. And God knew it was enough. Now, I heard no more. When the people had gone over about 2,500, it was a Sunday night. I sat alone in the tent and I didn't know that it was alone. I didn't know that I was alone. I didn't even see the people going out. Why? Because I was condemned already. It stuck in my heart like a dagger. 
I, I wasn't blind, but I didn't notice the people going out. And there I sat all alone. And the old tent maker came to me and said, Well, my boy, what are you waiting for? I said, I don't know. And I got up and I walked out. But then when I got out, and it struck me again, you are condemned already, and if you die on the seat, you'll be in hell. So I went round to the other door, and old Mr. Ray was there chasing the young people away. And I was on the outside. Now say, that's it. This is a judge. He's chasing the people away from the door. And I'm on the outside, and I just went right in as hard as I go past him. And he looked at me. And he came to me, and he said, what's wrong with you, young man? Said, I am going to hell. Said, old David, I'm glad to hear it. Well, now, that was a strange expression, but that was David. And he was perfectly right. Well, said he, I'll send somebody to speak to you, for he wasn't a good hand at speaking to anxious people. And there I was, trembling. I think the first time I would have trembled in my life. Now, several people came, you know, and they were good people. There's some Baptists, some Presbyterian, some brethren, of course. And they talked to him, they had well been talking to the Pope. I was really anxious to be saved, but too anxious to be saved. I could think about nothing but condemned already, and young man, you're going to hell. Now, that went on for five weeks. Some nights the men had to stop preaching, as I shouted, I'm condemned already, and I'll be in hell. One night I fell off the seat underneath it, and I thought the best thing I could do was fill my mouth with the sawdust on the floor, lest they would blaspheme God, for I heard somebody talking about that. Well, I didn't do that, for a man come and lifted me up, and I got up on the seat again, but there's nothing only condemned already. Mind you, when you get a dose of that, every night for five weeks, you'll want to be saved. And I would have given anything to be saved. And they all helped me. And they would put their arms round my neck, and they would say, now read that, my dear young man. And I would read John 3, 16. And they said, now don't you believe that verse? I said, certainly I did. But con con confessedly, I didn't like them talking to me. I would rather they would left me alone. But they really meant well. They were all out to find, try and win the young man for Christ that was kicking up such a disturbance in the meeting. And then they'd say, don't you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Well, then you're saved. I said, I'm not saved. Well, they said, you're making God a liar. That's a foolish thing. No, I am not making God a liar. For I can't believe what I don't understand. Well, that went on for five weeks. I didn't cover it anymore. Now, at the end of five weeks, my little job finished. I was out again. Now, my brother was afraid of getting me in, getting into bad company or joining a football team, which I tried to do. But you see, I want you to go up to County Donegal and see your sister Mary. So I'm not going. But you see, I want you to go. Well, that made all the difference. If he wanted me to go, it made a whole lot of He wasn't happy about it. Now, says I, there's no use of me going up there for you. He doesn't know me. And I wouldn't know her. It was a long, long time since we, she parted and went. Well, <laughs> said I have no money. Well, said he, I'll pay you fair. Well, I knew that would pinch him. It was ten shillings to Donegal then. It's just a fraction more now. And at last I, I got a marked testament from a Baptist man who was very much interested in me. He was a good man. He was very much interested in me. He did his best to make God's way of salvation plain, but he couldn't do it for the very simple reason I could see nothing and hear nothing and feel nothing only. Young man, you're condemned already, and if you die on the seat, you'll be in hell. So I put this the marked testament in my pocket and a lot of tracts. And he said... James said, maybe you'll get saved before you get to Donegal. I didn't answer him. I got on the train. I got to Derry. I got out to Derry. And then I asked a man to get me off the tram at the, at the bus for letter Kenny. And the old thing stuck. And I sat on the top after paying my penny. And then I got down and I said, Mister, I want you to leave me off at the station. Uh, are you not going? He says, hey, this is the station here. Eh? You're an old tar shed. And well, he said, I, if this is the station, I'd better go down and look about the train. So I went down, I could see nobody. The ticket collector and the station master and everybody else was a laboring man. He was working way up the line with a pick and shovel. So I went up to him and said, I, will I get a train for that? I can't well to see. There might be one in about four hours. So uh, I went round Derry for a little while. Now I got the old train, it was a little puffing engine, and it hadn't enough steam to take it into Latter Canny. It stopped about half a mile out of the station. And I played the whole road. And at last, when the train couldn't go any further, I got out, and I thought I would go. 
So I started to walk up the railway and I seen a woman coming to meet me. So I, this might be her and it might not, I can't tell. As she come and she said, Frank, I'm glad to see you. And she kissed me and she took me by the hand. And I said, I wonder what's going to happen next. And she put me in an old pony and cart and we started for a long ride up the mountainside and I kept my mouth shut for a change. Condemned already, a young man, you'll be in hell. And the devil said, now, you're up here in a country where nobody knows you. Don't tell anybody. Nobody knows you're anxious. Go and have a good time. Oh, that's like the devil. But right on top of that came a little word from heaven that I didn't know was in the Bible. After this, the judgment. Now we got home and we got a little bit to eat and we went to bed. And I stayed there for quite a number of weeks and worked hard and sore. And every week I got nothing. Then, uh, the, the, the old man, he was a very cross old man, not that I cared, but he was very cross. My sister was a good woman who was very kind to me. Now, uh, the, the, the Baptist man that I referred to used to write to me every week, once a week. And in every letter he sent some gospel tracts. At last I got sick reading gospel tracts. I was beginning to get careless. My anxiety was leaving me. I said, well, I've had a good dose of it. And if it leaves me, I can't help it. I can't save myself. And nobody can tell me how to get saved. Now that's the way I spent up there for a while. But they had built a new stable out there, my brother-in-law had. And he came to me one morning and he said, Mary and me's going to a fair away down at Guildford. And you'll be alone all your days. And I to myself, thank God for that. And the way they went. Now he said, hey, there's plenty there for you to eat. Make your own food. And we'll be back about six. And I started. And said, he, before uh, uh, I leave, I want to ask you to do me a little favor. And I wasn't very anxious about doing him favors. Nevertheless, I was depending on him. And I said, what is it? He said, I want you to get up on the roof of that stable and put a coat of tar on it. There's the tar, and there's the brush, and there's a ladder. And I said, all right, but I was glad to get rid of him. He was a cross old man. Now, just as I was getting up the ladder, the postman came with a letter. And it was unusually bulky. Said I know the religious letter, I'm sick looking at them, I'll not read it. I put it in my pocket. And I got up the ladder and I started to get going. But no, this letter's in my pocket. I couldn't get on with the work. I wanted to do it, but I couldn't get going. So at last I put the thing down and said, I'm going to read this letter. I had it is just what I expected, a letter full of religion and full of preaching. Put it in my pocket and went on with the work a little bit. But everything was very uncomfortable. The old bridge wasn't right, and the tower wasn't right. I nearly fell off the roof once or twice. So I started, there was something in this letter, I'll not tell you what I thought about it. I'll read it again, and I'll read it a second time. But I see nothing in it. Why? Because the devil let me blind me. That's why. That's why a lot of you people in the tent get, get saved. You've attended the meetings regularly. You've listened with rapt attention, most respectfully. Well, now, I started and I read the letter again. No, just the same old religious letter. And I put it in my pocket and I started to work again, but all in vain. Well, I was disgusted with myself and everybody and everything else. And I stood looking around me for a little while. I was in a country where you would hear absolutely nothing, only a dog barking or maybe a rooster crow. And that was all, all day long. It was very lonely, the big change from England, but it was just the medicine I needed. Well, I'll have another go at this letter. I'm condemned already. If I fall off the roof, I'll be in hell and I'll read the letter again. So I took it out and read it fairly carefully, but I saw nothing in it until I come down to the end of the letter. When I got to the end of the letter, John 3 and 36 was quoted. At least the first half of it, I should have said. And I should have said written. But it was different from the rest of the writing. It was printed in black letters with his pen. And it was underlined. Now I never noticed that before because the devil had me blind. But I noticed it this time. And I stood and looked at it. Now you can visualize me uh, in the roof of the stable. With a book of the towel at my foot and a towel brush in my hand. And my, my soul as black as a tar. And I didn't know and I don't care very much what would happen. I was what I call at my wit's end Psalm 107. Of course, I didn't know there was a Psalm 107 then. Much less did I know that it said, When they've come to the wit's end, the Lord bringeth them into the desired haven. Now, he said, I, there's something strange about this. I, he, he printed, he wrote all the last letter. He printed that word and he underlined it. He wasn't want me to notice it. 
And I said, H-A-T-H. Well, I never got much education, and I don't want you to think that I did, but I knew what hard and half meant. I thought that means half. I said, I never noticed that before. And I said, as what? Everlasting life. And who are that? He that believeth. There's a lot of mockery, that's what I mean. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And I'm believing and I'm believing and believing until I can believe no more. And I've wept to me, eyes were sore, and mind you, I didn't weep for anything. <clears throat> but I wept and I when he was going to hell. And then my knees were sore praying. I'm not exaggerating. My knees were sore praying. I remember stopping one night on top of the Albert Bridge Road at about 12 o'clock. Because I got lost every night on the way home. And everybody was away home without me. And I got down on the top of the Albert Bridge Road on my knees. And there was a bad woman came past, but when she heard me praying, she ran for her life. And I said, Blessed God, they asked me to come to the Lord Jesus. But Lord, how can I do that? He's up in heaven, and I'm down in Belfast. How can I come? Now that ended that. I didn't go any further, and I should have done, but I didn't know the verse. Now then, my knees were sore praying, and my eyes were sore weeping. For mind you, I didn't want to be in hell. And it's only a fool that says they don't care whether they go to hell or not. And candidly, I don't believe them. Now then, I said, I, I'll read it again. Uh, he that believeth on the Son, I believe that and I'm not a bit better. That was all I knew, you know. I'm not a bit better. And I believe until I'm sick, believe it, and I'm not a bit better. And then I read the verse again. It doesn't say he that believeth on the Son will feel a bit better. No, it does not. Well, what does it say? It says, ha, hath everlasting life. Well, says I, that's a bit of light now. I don't know whether it was like the man with that, 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 that no, in the gospel that was like saw trees walking or not, but it certainly enlightened that I wasn't saved, mind you. And I said, now, there's something about that verse, and I'm going to keep on reading it, and I kept on reading it, I don't know how many times, but at last I said, now I'll read it backwards this time. And I read everlasting life. And I said, Lord, I would die on the roof for everlasting life. It was a Saturday morning. 23rd day of September, 1905. And uh, I did it backwards, everlasting life. Well, says I, Lord, I know people as this, but I haven't got it. But if you give it to me, I'll gladly die on the roof. But dying on the roof or any other place doesn't bring salvation. So the next thing was now, uh, everlasting life, H-A-T-H -H spells hat, has it? Who has it? He that believeth on the Son. I said, I, that beats me. I just can't see that. But then you don't get saved for seeing. You get saved for believing. You all hear that. Because there are a lot of you waiting to see this and waiting to see that. And you maybe wait too long and lose your soul. But you get it for believing. What will you believe? The way you believe anything else. Didn't you believe there was a meeting here tonight? You did. You must have believed somebody. Well, believe God the same way. Or believe on the Son the same way. An everlasting life is yours. Well, I would have kind of disgusted with myself. And the letter and everything else. But said I, there's something is letter for me. And I'll read it again. So again, he that believeth on the Son. Now do I believe on the Son? I was getting down to business. But mind you, I was afraid of being in hell. And I don't believe everybody, anybody was ever saved. Until they were afraid of being in hell. You can talk whatever way you like. Now then, <clears throat> I did it again. He that believeth on the Son. Now we'll stop there. Do I believe on the Son? I knew the Son meant the Lord Jesus. Well, I, I don't know. I'm believing all I can believe anyway. But the Bible doesn't say believe all you can believe. It just says believe. Well, what's the next thing? He that believeth on the Son. Well, now I believe on the Son as far as I know. And you will reason and thing out. I wouldn't let anybody push a thing down with hope neither then nor now. And uh, I kept reasoning out to myself, talking to myself on the roof. Now you can visualize me there. And uh, he that believeth on the Son. Well, now I believe the Son all the time. I can't believe any more. What's the next word? Ha! And it is again. H-A-T-H. Well, has means has it. I'm sure about that. Has what everlasting life. Well, today that beats me and it beats all. I'm believing and I'm believing and I'm believing and I can believe no more and I haven't got everlasting life. But then I began to think this is a verse out of the Bible. And you know, being a good Presbyterian, I believe the Bible from head to heels and the man who go to hell that doesn't believe it. He can be whatever kind of an alien he likes. I'm telling you that Pete, every night. And I want you all in the tent that hasn't been fought to remember that. You refuse to go to the Bible and God will send you to hell. As an unbeliever. I will read it again. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And I stood for a little while. 
And instead of trying to believe anymore, I forgot all about believing. And I forgot all about coming and all about trusting. And all about taking and all about looking. And just as I stood there, and mind you, I, I felt I was standing on the edge of heaven. And my last prayer on the roof before God saved me, Lord, I've missed it. I'm going to be in hell. A short life and a merry one. And I felt I was hanging over it. And I said, Lord, if you can't take me to heaven, don't send me to hell. I prayed no more. And I read no more. But the blessed Holy Spirit, without any vision, without any wonderful excitement or sensationalism, I just took it in, by the help of the Spirit of God, that there's a man dying in your place. What more do you want? And do you know, I thought it was the silliest being in Donegal for not seeing it sooner. Why did you not see it sooner? Just because the devil had me blinded. And I forgot all about leaving and coming and trusting. And I just took it in. There's a man dying in your place. And what more do you want? And I was saved on the spot. I didn't shout glory to God. I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't jump with joy for if I had. I'd have fallen off the roof. But glory to God I was saved. In my own simple way. Now I told you, and I put it in the paper, that I would tell you how, when and where I was saved. I have told you how I was convicted of sin. And the goodness of God to me while I was a sinner. And I've told to you how I was led to the gospel and how I got saved reading a letter on the roof of the stable in the town land of Loch Nagin, two miles outside the town of Letterkenny in the county Donegal. I've told you how, I've told you when, I've told you where. But then I told you I would produce to you some truths from the Bible, how I know. For there are some very wicked men in the city, and mind you, they're preachers, and I say nobody can know. But I want to tell you two things about that man. It doesn't a finger crack who he is or where he goes on Sunday. The first thing is he knows absolutely nothing about God's salvation. For no saved person will say nobody can know. And the second thing is, though he may know quite a lot, and may know quite a lot about the Bible, he knows absolutely nothing about what the Bible says about God's way of salvation. Now I said I would produce to you three Bibles, three reasons from the Bible, but I'm going to produce to you a lot more. And to prove to you right up to the hip that it's absolutely false. It's a cruel thing and it's a wicked thing for to say nobody can know. Now I can understand ordinary unsaved people talking like that, for we don't expect them to know. But if a man reads the Bible, he ought to know. And it's as plain as A, B, C. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is how I know that I'm saved. I was asked this in Long Beach, California, when I was preaching in the Spit and Argy Club. And I've been in some rough places in my life, and I got into there, and I was thankful to God to get out. A Spit and Argy Club, if you please. On the Long Beach, you couldn't see the end of it that long, and the, county, the town council put down on the beach where the tide never comes in a great big semicircle of seats, something like what's in the governor hall. And a pulpit for you, please. It was a good idea for to rid the streets of corner boys and moochers and rogues and ruffins and rascals, and they all got down there. And of course they stayed there all day, for there was no rain down there in California. They took the lunch with them, and two brethren said, Will you come along to the spit and argue club? So I wonder what kind of a turnout this is going to be. So I said, Yes, I'll go. So I went, and there wasn't long that a dirty old man got up, a corner boy, and he started to ridicule the Bible. Well, you know, Irish blood can't stand up, and I'm an Irish man from the backbone out. And I want you to all to sta understand that. And when I'm at that, I want to say, there's very few places you go in the, in the civilized world. I've never been to any of them yet where you'll get more genuine Christians and more plain gospel preaching than in the north of Ireland. Now, I couldn't stand up. And I went to the superintendent. He was an officer of the law. He's there to keep order. And I said, I beg your pardon, sir. Would you allow me ten minutes? To see who are you and what are you? I said, my name is Frank Knox. I live in Belfast. I'm an evangelist. To see you preach the gospel, I do. To see you go next. So it was well I hadn't to get my sermon up. And he went to the little blackboard and he stroked out two, ma two names. To see, those are only Phillips. If nobody turns up, they preach, but you go next. And man, I started to pray. And the old man got down and I got up and I took my overcoat off. 
because I kept my feet overcoat on for fear it wouldn't be there when I was done. And I, I, I thanked them all very much, and I thanked the superintendent, and I said, I'm going to tell you how, when, and where I got saved. And as soon as I started to preach, I said, when a man gets up here to ridicule the Bible, the first thing he does is vomit out his own ignorance. I thought that wasn't a bad start. But mind you, I kept my eye on the tide, for they throw you into the tide if you annoy them. So I run risks anyway. Now I started to tell them how I knew. I'm going to tell you that tonight. And man, you've heard the thunder a while ago. Well, it was something like that. As they yelled at me from every quarter, how do you know you're saved? And a lot of ugly things that I'm not going to come over. When it all quelled down, I said, I'm going to tell you how, when and where I got saved, and the storm wasn't so great. So I started to tell them how, when, and where I got saved. And then they want to know, how do you know you're saved? Now that's a proper question. I asked my brother that when I was only five years of age. Well, to see, Frank, you'll know when you get it. And that was a good answer. Well, now, I told them how, when, and where I got saved, and they listened wonderful well. But if over here there was a lot of rowdy, wicked men yelling at me, over on my right hand there was a lot of Pentecostal women. And they were shouting at me too. And they would shout glory to God. And they would shout hallelujah. And they would shout hey, amen. So I was in between two fires. One was the fire from heaven, and the other was the fire from the Pentecostals. Well, no matter. I got, they meant well, you know. They meant well. I'm not speaking to right of late. And I, the superintendent did not. That means you have two minutes to pronounce the benediction. <laughs> so, so I finished up. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, Anybody would like ten minutes more from Mr. Knox? And then I turned to you, about 90% of the hands went up. Again, I said, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm going to spend ten minutes toting the scripture. Then there come another volley from rogues and rascals and ruffins about you and your Bible. But I kept on quoting the Bible for ten minutes, and then I thanked them all, bid them goodbye, and I said, God bless you, and clear it out. But I'm going to quite quote quite a few scriptures, and the first one is, and as you got in the telegraph, Acts 16:31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. Now, I know some people, I, 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 they emphasize the word be, that's not right, that's not good reading. They emphasize the word be instead of the word shall. And if the sentence is read right, you emphasize the word shall, thou shalt be saved. And the worst language is, but saved thou art. And that's one verse that makes me believe I'm saved. And then, John 3.36, which I quoted to you, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And hath means hath. And I believed it, and I got it. Of course, I didn't go to them then, for I didn't know the difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As a matter of fact, I searched the Old Testament for the third chapter of John after I was saved up and done it all. But I had to go and look for a Bible first. And then when I got the Bible with a big brass hasp on it, and I got it open. And I said, I wonder what I'll find half. Now, I don't care whether I find it, book and revelation or, or, or Genesis, but I didn't know anything about those books. But I said, I'll begin anyway, and I think I began someplace about the second book of Chronicles, where there's all those great big hard names in history, but no matter about Chronicles or names, if I can get the word half, I'm right. Well, I went through that, and I went through first and second uh, Kings and Chronicles, and Esther and Esther and I and Nehemiah, but I can't get half. If I can get half, I don't care if I can only get it on the cover of the Bible, I'll be right, but I couldn't get it. At last I went on, and maybe I was searching the Bible all right. And I come to a blank page in the Bible. Said, I wonder what all this is about, a blank page. I thought there was print on every page. And on the opposite page it said, the New Testament. So I wonder what kind of a thing that is. But I always thought the Bible was one bit. So I thought I'll have a go at it anyway. So I got into Matthew. And do you know, I, I could remember I got to Matthew such at 11, 28, and various other places. Now, I remember them hearing that in the tent. They used to go to Scripture, although they were really good preachers, and they, I said, I see, no, but, but that's not what I want, I want half, and if I can get half, I don't care for anybody or anything, if I can get half in the Bible, I'm right. Well, then I got into Mark. Well, there wasn't very much gospel in Mark, but I did hear some quotation in the Bible from Mark, but my, what do you think when I got to chapter 16, he that believeth not shall be done. Says, I, Lord, I wonder is that me now, or do I really believe? And have I got it? Lord, I want the word to find half. And I got into, I got into Luke. And I got into Luke. 
and I could find a whole lot of passages there that the preachers quoted night after night. Uh, Luke 19 and 10, Zacchaeus. Of course, I, didn't put, I couldn't pronounce Zacchaeus, and I didn't try. And because it would do half there. And then I got into chapter 23, where they read about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. I think you get occupied with Luke 23 and 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Now, says I, Lord, that's all right, and I believe it, but I want the word half. And if it's in the Bible, I'll get it. So I got out of Luke, and I got into John. And then when I got into the John, said I to myself, I'm getting hot, I think I'm getting near it. And I began to read in John, and I remember 129, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Man said, Aye, that's good, but I want half. And then I got into chapter 2, and I got to the marriage feast of Canaan. I mean, I got to the chapter where that was recorded, and I said, That's very good, I remember preaching about that, but that's no use to me, I want half. So what do you think I got into chapter 3? Man said, I believe I'm getting here. And then I held tight. And so I got down to, to verse 18. My God said, I read it is again. Condemned already. That's just what I said. And then you, I trembled. Some people think, you know, when you get saved, you never tremble anymore. I never trembled right till after I got it. But I'm thankful to God my trembling. and never, never shoot the gospel, nor the work of Christ on the cross. But I was really wondering now, did it get simple I got on the roof of this table? Was it really the genuine article? I wonder was it the right thing? I don't feel any better. Well, that's strange, not a bit strange. The Bible doesn't tell you any place, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and feel happy and jump with joy and shout glory, hallelujah. If you did that, that's all right, you'd affair, but I didn't. But they don't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And I got to verse 18. There it is. There's the old preacher. There he's pointing right at me. And the tears running down his face. Young man, he that you condemned already. And if you die on the seat, you'll be in hell. Said I, my God, what will I do next? I'll go on. And I'll keep looking for the word half. And you can have some idea of how I felt when I got down to the last verse. He that believeth on the son half. And I put, me, I put my finger on it as I, Lord, it's there. H-A-T-H. And says, I devil, it's there. H-A-T-H. And I have. And do to God, so I had it. I was very, very, very happy. And then you know I thought I'd be happy all the rest of my life. I tell you, nay, that's not the way to heaven. That's not the Lord Jesus promised the disciples. And you can't find any man in the Bible that was happy all his life. Not only either. How could he be happy all his life when he had a wife and family? But notice again, if you please, even the Christ wasn't always happy. I'm speaking very reverently now. You all know that as he drew near to the cross. Well, I felt very happy for a week. I've got it anyway, for I've got it in the Bible. Half means had it, and I have it. And you couldn't take it off, and no, not with dynamite. I'm saved all right. Well, then, a wee bit of a text got up between me and the hired man. And I didn't say anything I shouldn't have said. As far as I remember, I think I cut the old gentleman. Well, now, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't do that, but I knew it was wrong. And man, I was terrible, terrible sorry. I went to apologize to him as a Catholic, and he talked about your Christianity. No wonder. Now, I was very, very sorry for that. And I confessed my sin and I wept so over doing it. But by and by, the joy of the Lord come back to my soul again. Now, that's how I got saved. Now, First John 5, 13, you please. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have everlasting life. Now, I could spell the word no all right, and I knew that no meant no. And I said, that's good. I read that. Of course, I didn't read that. Just there and then I had to take time to find it. And then I, I got another verse which convinces me now, still, I didn't know those verses then, but I'm telling you how I know now. And then I come to First Peter 1, 18, and this is a good one for the Catholics. If there's one in the meeting tonight, God loves you, and Christ has died for you. And Peter says that you're not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And to see you know that, for as much as you know that you were not. You see it in the past tense, these people that Peter's writing to, the habit, the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Well, it says you know there. Well, now, I kept on reading, and of course, by and by, and maybe after years, I come to Second Corinthians 5.1. For we know 
that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that for means if my body falls to pieces with decay and disease, Peter says I must soon put off this tabernacle, which means he must soon die, and Paul says have another house. A house, a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, which doubtless refers to the resurrection body, John 5, 28-29, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, you see, you know that. Well, now, Paul says, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, the resurrection body. And of course, as I kept on reading my Bible year by year, and I never read as much as I'm doing just now, and I'm thankful to God for that. I got into John 6 one time, and I came down to where the lot of the disciples went and left the Lord Jesus. Don't think, my brethren, that all the disciples were saved. They definitely were not. There were a lot of disciples because the Lord gave them bread and fish. And when the bread and fish was done, away they went. But they didn't all go. So when the Lord seen them going, I'm in John 6 now, he said to the apostle, the disciple, uh, the apostle, will you also go away? But Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, says Peter, we believe and are sure. Why would he sure? Because he believed. And he believed and he was sure. And he was sure because he believed. Now then, there's another thing I want to draw your attention to, and it's this. That's Second Corinthians 5, 17. The Apostle Paul's writing to the saints at Corinth. And he said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I know your margin says new creation, all right, but please remember, I'm preaching the gospel, or trying to do it. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, that's just exactly where I stand. From the day I got saved, all things became new to me. I was done with a football, every Christian ought to be. And there's something wrong with a Christian that's not. I don't care who he is or what he is. I certainly was done with a gambling, for that was a cursed business, and I never liked it, though I enjoyed it with the rest of the boy. And then, I was done with a theatre, I didn't need that anymore, for it was a dirty old hole most of the matter. And there's nothing there for the believer, and I just went because the boys went, but there was nothing there for to entertain me. And then, the next thing, uh, I, I was done with a box, and I never had the gloves on since. No, no. Now, where did you stop all those things for two reasons? One reason was, I didn't need them anymore. I was perfectly satisfied with Christ. And another reason is because I knew they wouldn't belong to a Christian. Christians shouldn't indulge in those things. And if any of you young men do that, I'm going to advise you kindly as your brother in Christ, cut that out, cut that out. You'll never be much worth the Lord while you go on like that. Rid yourself of everything, every unequal yoke of every kind, and disassociate yourself with all unbelievers except when you're working with them, you have to do that. For Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, that if you don't mix with the ungodly, you'll have to go out of the world altogether. And he's a few of them in 2 Thessalonians 3 for not working. Now you have to work with ungodly people. That's the right thing to do. If a man he doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. 2 Corinthians Thessalonians chapter 3. And the audience in front of me looked for the like people that eat. Well, you ought to work. Now then, notice this to you please. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now notice please, it's in Christ. It's not in some place on Sunday. I'm not going to over them at all because it would take me a long time. But you can be in them all. And I'm not going to say about them all. But you can be in them all and yet not be in Christ. Now I'm going to cook you a few scriptures with these words in Christ in them. So somebody, if you're not done with your conversion, no, I'll never be done with it. Now notice it again, you please. Uh, in Christ. Now in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Quite plain. You don't need to be a, a scholar to read that. And then, that's in Christ for no condemnation. And then when you come to second to, to Ephesians 2.13, you read, um, You who are once were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, and now in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, what for? For nearness to God. Now when you come to 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're in Christ for a new creation, a new creature. Now I'm in Christ, as every believer is, to be sure. And as such, I'm a new creature. 
Now, not only have I quoted all those verses, which gives me divine authority for believing that I'm saved, but my life is definitely, permanently, radically changed. But I hear somebody thinking, and he says, well, that old fellow's all right, you know, but he's not enjoying life. Well, if I'm not, you're not. And I want to tell you, you know, you're thinking, you know, if I become that, I'd be an old, long-faced Morrisonian. That's what the devil makes you believe. And he'll keep you there. But I'll tell you a little thing. I have more joy in my soul, alone with Christ in five minutes, than ever you've had in all your life, or ever you will have. But if somebody can do what I like, I can. I'm doing what I like every day. Well, you're the first Christian I've ever heard saying that. Well, you're hearing it now. Well, somebody says you're a real curiosity. Well, of course, a lot of people know that. You're a Christian and you're going to heaven. You can do what you like. I can do what I like. And I'm going to do what I like every day. And that's saying. Ah, but you know what I'm doing? I'm reading my Bible. And I'm praying. And I'm giving out tracts. And I'm visiting the sick people. And I'm preaching the gospel. And I'm doing what I like. And I enjoy it very much. I'm happy at it. So you see, I can do what I like. Now, I won't tell you anymore. I could tell you a whole lot. But I don't think it's necessary. And I don't want to keep you any longer. And anything more, I might tell you, I don't think would be very profitable. I will tell you, we think. After I got saved, they were up in Donegal, there came two letters. So what, the same day. And the postal, and I read them now for you, Frank. And I read one from America, from a sister, Martha. She's a very smart young lady yet. I have four sisters in America, and the ages are from 82 to 92. So she put, her, she put a ticket in the letter saying, Frank, please come on the first boat just as you are. I'll be glad to see you. You'll be very welcome in our house. And I've got a job waiting for you, $18 a week on a suit of uniform. Well, I could, adv- I could visualize myself. A suit of uniform, $18 a week, attending in a mental home. Well, that's very good. I'm not going to throw that overboard. But I opened the other one and I read it. And it's from a brother in Belfast. Dear Frank, please come at once down to Belfast. The, the, the tramway manager wants to see you. And you know, I never knew there was a man in the Bible called Hezekiah. Much less did I know that he spread a letter before the Lord. But that's just exactly what I did. I went up the ladder into the wee place where they slept. And I put the two letters down on the left. And says, I love, there's two letters. One wants me to go to America. And wants me to go to Belfast. And Lord, I can go to what, both places. What do you want me to do? So I didn't do anything, and I didn't say, and the Lord didn't say me to me either. Some people believe in getting audible answers. Well, I don't, but I believe in getting answers all right. Well, by and by, the idea of going to America wore off me, and I started for Belfast, and I come back to my good brother again. You see, go and see the manager at once, you might get a job. And I went to the manager, and I got a job. I got a good recommendation by a Christian doctor. He's in heaven, too. And I got a job as sure as a lie. And you know, I got a suit of uniform, a man, you should have seen me in the uniform. And I started for three pence farther than an hour, and I was thankful to God to get. Why? Because I was earning enough to keep me eating. And I didn't, ex- I didn't elect a sponge on anybody. Well, then by and by, I was blamed for telling lies. Some passengers told lies on me, and the manager sent for me, and he put me on the carpet. And he said, Nox. I said, Yes, sir. Did he, you accused of telling lies. And did he, I want to, uh, an explanation from you. Well, did I, first of all, sir, I've got two letters in my pocket from passengers that was on that tram, that tram they were in, that will prove to you that that's wrong. Did he, I don't want to see the letters. What have you got to say? I said, it didn't happen. I didn't tell any lies. Well, said he, I don't believe you. Well, said I, listen to me, sir. I'll not allow you. Or any other man in Belfast accused me of telling lies because I'm saved. He got out of my office quick, but I didn't go out. Oh no, I didn't go out that hurry. Said I am not going out, sir. And if you don't take that back, I'll not go back to my town. And I didn't go. So that ended the contract on the tram. I'll not, I'll not go any further because I would keep you uh, long, but I'm telling you that because it just happened. And uh, the poor man, he wasn't born again, but he was very angry with me. Now, by and by, I went to work in English. I sold bread for a good while. And I got on well. I was very, lo- I was very fond of it. I served all the Roman Catholics in Smithfield every morning and went out on the shank and road and served all the orange men. <laughs> but, but sometimes, the time of the riots, Barney Hughes' men wouldn't go into Smithfield at all. They were afraid of getting shot. So I went in and I decided to use it to take all the bread off me. And I had none for the orange men. So, so I had to ring up the manager and tell him I wanted another load of bread. 
<laughs> well, now, what got me out of England at worst? They said they come to come a union there, a, uh, the, the Amalgamated Trades Union or something or another. And they said, you'll have to join a union flat. Said, I have to, is very strong, my good man. Well, says he, you'll have to join or lose your job. Well, said I, I'll answer you later on. But let me tell you, I'd rather lose my job than my conscience. I'll let you know later on. And the manager got up, me said, hey, you're not going to join the union, Frank. Said, I know, sir. I am not. Said, I, why? I said, because my conscience won't allow me. Well, he said, there's other men of conscience as well as you. Said, I, what other men do is not my business, sir. I'm not going to join the union. Well, said, hey, I don't want to lose you for you're useful. Although they won't sell bread, you'll be useful at other jobs. Said, that's a matter for yourself, sir. I won't join the union. Then they sent up word that they were going to stop English's flour down at the quay and not supply them with any more flour. So I went to the man and said, don't you worry, sir. There'll be no flour stopped for me. I come into you again 14 years ago and you treated me like a gentleman. And I done my job well, says he. You did, Frank, but we'll have to part. So we did part. And I remember well coming home with my last week's wages in my pockets. Five children waiting on my, my, my wife in heaven. A good, godly little woman. Now then, I begin to wonder about faith. I used to talk about faith, but I nearly forgot all about it now. As my last week's wages, as five children waiting on me, they wanted to know why I couldn't join in. Well, I couldn't explain that, and I couldn't explain it to somebody in a meeting tonight. You did that, that's your affair, not mine, and I'm not going to be it. I couldn't conscientiously do it, and I didn't. So what do you think when on Sunday I went to the morning meeting, I went to Sunday school class, and I went to preach someplace at night, but Monday we got the young children out to school, and I went up to the attic, and I said to the eldest girl, please don't call me if you can possibly help it. And I spent that day both weeping and praying all day. I was perfectly satisfied I'd done the right thing, but what am I going to do now? I did not leave my job to go to preach. I never was anxious for to get preaching. But on Tuesday, I was up in the attic praying and crying again, for I want to have it out with God, and a knock came to the door, and it's a bread server, one of our brethren. And I went down, and he said, Frank, is it true what I hear about you? He said, I don't offend what you heard, sir. Well, said he, I heard you left your job. Well, you're wrong, said I. I got through out of it, because I wouldn't join the union. Well, said he, Frank, I couldn't do that. He said, I, that's your affair, David. I have nothing at all to do with that. Well, now, now, see, we had a business meeting in our assembly last night, and the brethren all knew you well there, and you know them, and they sent me over to ask you if you'd come for a spell of gospel meetings, and I said no, right away, right and blunt. Well, said he, that's hard going, said he. What will I do? So I go and tell them I'm not going. Well, said he, would you tell us why you'll not come? I said, well, the only thing I can tell you now, I didn't leave my work to go to preach. I left my job because I couldn't conscientiously stay in it, and I'm looking for a job, and I was looking for a job. <laughs> However, uh, he said, I said, I'd say, he said, he wanted to come and say, prayer meeting. So, all right, I'll be over tomorrow, tonight, that's Tuesday night, for a prayer meeting every night. We had a prayer meeting every night that week, and I started meetings on Sunday in the month of October 1925, and I preached no to Christmas, and God saved a few souls, and they are, they are living yet, some of them. But one day, the first believers meeting I had there, I never had a believers meeting in my life, though I often talked to believers in the morning meeting or like that, but I, this is my first believers meeting. And I seen in the, in the, in the newspaper, Mr. Frank Knox, evangelist, if you please. I well, said, I commit that bit all. I never knew that before. He's going to speak to believers at four o'clock in Roslyn Street and preach the gospel at seven o'clock, said I, God help me. So I went to the Sunday school and I took my Bible class and I went over to the hall and it was half past four and I got there and I was glad it was. And there was a little man there up preaching. He, was, he used to be in the Baptist and he was opening a meeting for me. And says, I, Lord, keep this man going for I've nothing to say. But he sat down like a gentleman and I get up and you can call it cheek or impertinence or faith, whatever you like. I don't know what you call and I don't care. But I declare to you, I was summoning my leaves of the Bible and making the announcements. It was downright hypocrisy, but I didn't know where to read. So I looked at my Bible, and it's open at Genesis 15. Now, said I, brethren, Genesis 15. And then I said, Lord, help me, what will I say? So they all opened the Bible, and the hall was full. And, you know, I began to read in Genesis 15, 1. And the Lord said unto Abram, Fear not, <coughs> for I am seal, I am thy ward, I am thy shield, and I exceeding great reward. 
But I had all the opposite that which meant the devised version and I quoted from that. And I said, oh, brethren, the devised version says, the Lord sent unto Abraham, I am thy shield and thy word shall be exceeding great. <clears throat> and when I quoted from the devised version, I declare to you, they all thought it was a preacher. God forgive them. No matter. I preached on that day, fear not. Now just imagine me preaching on fear not. And me shaking in my boots for fear that I couldn't get it to spin out until, until five o'clock. That's exactly what I stood and I was preaching on fear not like a man. And at last when I got to the end of the meeting, I said, don't fear, brethren and sisters in Christ after going over a lot of things. When the nearest and dearest to you are carried out to the graveyard, don't fear, brethren, fear not. Well, they all knew I'd been through that experience. And man, I've seen the handkerchiefs coming out, and I'm seeing them weeping, and I looked at the clock, and it's, it's five o'clock, said, I glory to God, we'll close in prayer. Well, now, that was my first believer's meeting, and I'll never forget it. But going out to the hall, there was a big stalwart man, needed like a priest man, and I thought he was a cross man, but he wasn't. And he reached me an envelope just like that. Said, I, God help me, I wonder what this is. I've said something I shouldn't have said. For mind you, the brethren will go for you if, you, if you're not careful what you're saying. And in a whole lot of cases, they're quite right. Well, said, I am not going to read this letter. For there might be something in it, and not the preaching out of me for tonight. But after the meeting was over, it was packed. I went home, got the children to bed, and now said, I, Lord, I'm going to read this letter. The Lord have mercy upon me. And I opened it, and there was a five pound note in it. And written on the back of it, three or not. That I'd glory to God. That wasn't a bad start. Now, brother, I'll, I'll, I'll not keep you any longer. No, I'd like to do it. And you're listening remarkably well. But I want to say from then on to now, 36 years ago, I've been preaching the gospel in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, America, and Canada. And the Lord doesn't owe me anything. And as you know, brethren, I'm not preaching for money or preaching for a salary. Other men do again, that's not my business. I don't and I won't. But it gives the living God a chance to look after me. And if you take a good look at me, I think you'll agree he's looking after me well. The Lord doesn't owe me anything, and I don't owe the world anything, and I'm very, very thankful to God for that. Now I want the blessed Lord to bless this testimony of mine. Now if I've forgotten anything that you should think I would said, please let me know and I'll give it to you. For I don't want to disappoint anybody. Now then, I've said all I think I'll say tonight. I'll be praying for you possibly the early hours in the morning that God will bless you believers that we might spend our little lives for Christ while we're here and that you dear unsaved people, no matter who or what you are, you might hold it to Christ and get saved because someone will call and will not be heard. Someone will knock when the door is barred. Someone will fail of the saints the word shall you shall I. God forbid that any of you should. Now I love to speak of Jesus that name how sweet it sounds. Oh tell it out you faithful to watch the motor's bounds. I love to speak of Jesus and what he did for me. It was in the year 1905 September 23. I do remember well one day when out on pleasure bent I got an invitation to a meeting in the tent. So just to please that person, I decided to go in. No love for God or Christ had I, for I was dead in sin. But ere that meeting ended, I was almost in despair. John 3.18 was a text that night the vicar chose. And scenes of death and judgment before my vision rose. Condemned already fearful words that fixed me to the sea. And man, I'll never forget that. And one day, a letter I received. And as I read its content sore, I on the Lord believed. H-A-T-H, those letters for, were simply underlined. I just took in what God had said and made his promise mine. Now many years has gone since then, but Christ remains the same. Eternal life he gives to those who trust his blessed name. Saved by the blood of Jesus, kept by his power alone. This my glorious privilege, seeking to make him known. And when I see my Jesus, I praise his blessed name for the grace that stooped and saved me from sin and hell and shame. Oh, sinners, come to Jesus. He'll make your life anew. And then at home in glory, you'll praise Jesus too. Yes, you and I together in heavenly mansions bright will praise the Lord that saved us from death and hell and night. Now, that's the end of that. 
But I put another little verse to it. You can call it a wise version. And here it is. And so I came to Jesus while standing on the roof. And in this good old Bible I have the glorious proof. While passing through this wilderness of sin and woe and strife, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. God bless you, everyone. Shall we pray? O oh God, our loving Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank thee for bringing these people together. God bless them, everyone. O oh God, save everyone in a tent that's not yet saved. Bless the simple remarks we have made from a happy experience. Don't let any of them lose their soul, neither with sin, nor pleasure, nor the world, nor even with trying to believe, but just believe the message, and he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. O oh God, bless thy people. We thank thee for their prayers. We thank thee for their kindness. O oh God, thy people are good to us, and they're kind to us. Bless them, bless their homes, save their loved ones in those homes. And now, loving Heavenly Father, take our thanks for controlling the elements and every other adverse circumstances. And out of the meeting tonight, get glory to Him who alone is worthy of glory, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Will my theme of rapture